Welcome to our session on leveraging clinical pathways to improve quality of care and resource utilization. I'm Sophia Ang. I'm the Vice Chairman Medical Board for Patient Safety and Quality at the National University Hospital in Singapore. I'm also a practicing anesthesiologist. With me is my co-speaker, Dr. Sandhya. And I'm the Deputy Director in Clinical Governance Department, and I work on quality and safety along with Sophia here. And basically, I'm also a trained pediatrician uh, earlier. We come from sunny Singapore, and Singapore was ranked world's number two in terms of health care outcomes by The Economist. We are a very small country, five million in population, on this tip of the Malayan Peninsula. And we spend about three to four percent of our GDP on health care. Bloomberg has ranked us in 2012 as one of the healthiest countries in the world. We come from an academic medical institute, the National University Hospital, which is quite a sprawling area. And it has 1,300 beds, 7,000 staff, and about 30 operating rooms. We have every subspeciality except probably for burns. So this is the overall uh, agenda for today. We'll talk a little bit about the background of clinical pathway development and discuss a little bit about the issues we have in implementing pathways and hopefully give some examples on areas that we have done well. The Institute of Medicine defines the quality, what is quality of care. And there are many components, as you well know. And care should be collaborative and evidence-based, well-designed, automated where possible, have decision support systems, and this is how we hope to achieve great outcomes in our patients. Worldwide, there's still a big gap in what is recommended as quality of care and what we are able to deliver. And in Singapore, we are still striving to improve. The problem being is that we see a very wide range of patients, patients that require acute services as well as chronic. We want to cover a preventative as well as catastrophic type events. And the health delivery system has to deliver all the quality indicators in all these different types of patients. Hence, and on top of that, health course, healthcare system needs to be sustainable and adaptable. So the 21st century healthcare delivery system needs to have many aspects, evidence-based, it needs to be patient-centered, it also needs to demonstrate value. Singapore is also undergoing a silver tsunami. We are aging more rapidly than many countries in Asia and even relative to the world. So we definitely need a good chronic care model and we're still trying to learn how to achieve this. One of the components of a chronic care model, of course, is to have a defined care pathway. Of course, there are many other aspects that are also required in a chronic care model. So the current emphasis would need to be on quality care, cost containment, and a collaboration between patients and the various healthcare partners. And we can only do so with good multidisciplinary teams, case managers, and pathways. So for us to all move from a good healthcare system to a great healthcare system, we need to take care of many components and aspects of healthcare, quality issues, service problems, and also efficiency. So why clinical pathways? Well, there are many reasons that we want to choose pathways as one of our tools. And number one reason would be that simplification and standardization is one of the most important actions in reliable care. In our hierarchy of actions to deliver reliable care, simplification and standardization is critical. And clinical pathways help us in this aspect. We are well, all well acquainted with this uh, diagram here, where if one single step is only is 95% reliable, by the time you reach the 100th step, the chances of having a reliable system is almost zero because the more steps we have, the chances of reliability is diminished. 
So clinical pathways does help us greatly in terms of standardizing and simplifying and to cut out unnecessary steps where they, are, where they uh, present themselves and to keep ourselves in, track, in a good checklist on what is necessary. So we didn't originate pathways. Construction industries and other industries have been using pathways as a form of checklist to help ensure the essential steps are done. So although pathways have been used from the 70s, in Singapore, we have only started using it a bit more widely over the 90s. There are many definitions of clinical pathways, and this is one of them that we use. It's an abbreviated ver version of a multidisciplinary process which needs to occur in a timely and sequential manner to achieve good quality healthcare outcomes. And there are other definitions as well, if you prefer to use these others. Clinical pathway is not a mandatory plan. It's not a substitute for clinical judgment or substitute for physician orders. So when you try to start a pathway, a very common outcry from the doctors and physicians would be uh, that of denial and anger. No, uh, it cannot be converted to cope mode medicine. Are you trying to demean our many years of education? Are you saying that our jobs can just be taken over by somebody weaving an algorithm or flow? So these are common outcries uh, and protest. But you have to reassure them that this is not so. It's merely a, a form of a good tool to integrate and allow various healthcare partners to collaborate together to have good outcomes. So here are some of the important objectives of clinical pathways to improve quality, efficiency. It is a good tool to use as for audit, to help in communication, collaboration, continuity. And it's a good tool to flag out variances so that we can improve our outcomes. Just like Don Berwick had mentioned our first plenary, the psychology of a change management is very important. And I think clinical pathways help in that psychology because it helps people to act themselves into a new way of thinking, which is much easier than to think yourself into a new way of acting. So I think pathway helps to guide us and focus our, uh, the staff to a new way of, uh, uh, of uh, change and management and change and uh, outcomes in healthcare. This is uh, one of the questions in the patient safety culture survey. So in the National University Hospital, we hold the HRQ patient safety culture survey about uh, once every two years. And we do well in some areas, and there are some questions that we don't do so well in, and this is one of them. Teamwork across hospital units. So we do well in the, um, in the questions of teamwork within a hospital unit, but across the hospital unit, we have, we have still some way to go. Now you can see that over the many years, and we've been doing the survey from the year 2005, we have improved in the question, hospital units do not coordinate well with each other. That's the question F2, as you see. Now the green bars uh, strongly disagree, so it's a double negative. So over, if you are improving, the green bars should increase in percentage. So we are inching up a little bit, but I think still a long way to go. Now, this is apparently a, a question that many hospitals do not do so well in as well. So pathways are helpful in that they will allow different departments to be able to communicate and collab collaborate well together. And there's another question that we don't do so well in, in a patient safety culture survey, and that is the question on hospital handoffs and transitions. So where there's a transition in care, patient information during shift change, or when they have to be, uh, be transferred from one area to another, you can see over the years, some improvements, the green bars getting higher in percentage, but we still have a long way to go. And again, pathways help us communicate in handoffs and transitions. So these are some of the common barriers I had mentioned earlier, and you maybe need to be prepared for some of these barriers should you be starting pathways. So could I ask the audience, how many of you are already having pathways in your area of practice? I think that's quite a number of us. I think these barriers would sound quite familiar to you. 
And now I'll hand over to Dr. Sandhya, who will bring you through on how to select a topic for the pathways. Uh, once you have tried to overcome some of the barriers, then will come a question on how do we go about developing a pathway. If you're a novice organization that wants to start with this particular project, then you have to consider how do I look into it objectively. This particular slide here does tell you the whole, summarizes the process of clinical pathway from beginning to end. There are multiple steps here and we cannot go through these steps in details because of the time constraint. But we'll focus on some of the key ones that you need to address to certain extent so that you will be able to achieve the similar success that we could manage to get in some of our pathways. Basically on how do we go about selecting a path, uh, selecting a topic, selecting a team, evaluate, monitor, train people, and ensure that it succeeds as good as it should. So, when it comes to developing uh, pathways, we need to take into consideration some sort of objective evaluation of our data. And that data can come from our DRGs and ICDs. Most of you must be familiar with what DRGs are. These are diagnostic related groups and these are similar resource utilization related groups that come together. So that if we choose these objectively, that will enable us to focus on certain areas that we need to really work on. So the basic principles of uh, prioritizing the areas to focus on tells us that it should be the high volume conditions, long length of stay conditions, or high cost and high risk areas that need to be focused on. But that is not the uh, only area that we, we can also consider if you are going to implement some new procedure in your organization, you may want to consider developing a pathway for that to standardize care for that new particular procedure so that you don't have many complications arising from that. And in addition to that, if a clinician who is very enthusiastic and wants to incorporate and he wants to develop a pathway, though it's not high volume or high length of stay, we should not discourage this clinician from doing that particular act because we do want people to buy in to this particular things. And basically, we should keep our objective in line with the hospital strategic drive or the national strategic drive as well. So basically, what we need to do to begin with, if you're a novice organization starting on this journey, do an analysis of your DRGs or ICD codes to look at and identify high volume and long length of stay. So if you, uh, I think many of you have got the handouts. Uh, if you haven't gotten the handouts are out here, just please grab hold of one sheet each. And uh, I would like you to just take three to five minutes to do a quick analysis of the data given in the handout that you have, and then identify the areas to focus on for the development of clinical pathway in an organization which has this data. And state the pathway that you would identify for and if you stay, and then tell us what is the reason why you would like to choose this focus. And also, if you don't select it, also let us know the reason. So if you, those of you who do not have any uh, handout, you can refer to the slide here. These, the table one is the top 20 DRGs of top volumes. So these are the ones that are for this particular organization the top 20 volume-based DRGs for the year 2015. And table two are the top 20 ALOS-based or average length of stay, long length of stay-based DRGs. So these are the data. Just take about three to five minutes and discuss amongst yourself, help each other, share this uh, sheet if you don't have one, and just try to analyze and focus which area would you like to develop pathway if you were the person in charge of this particular project. Yeah, perhaps those that don't have a handout, uh, would you like to s put up your hand so then those that are distributing will be able to come round to you? It probably is a e little bit easier than to look at the screen. So again, the first sheet will be those of the highest volume and the second table is those with longest length of stay. And you, if you were going to start a pathway, perhaps you would like to look through and decide which would you choose to begin. We'll just give you a few minutes oh, to uh, wander over the data. Uh, can someone so, give a sheet here? Uh, someone in front here uh, does not have a sheet. I think no, no more left, I think. I think 
Uh, perhaps you can share it because I think they've finished. Perhaps uh, extremely sorry oh. about that. Is that a street there? Is there a, uh, the in the gentleman front in front? Well. Thank you. And the, ah, this gentleman. Okay, maybe a few more seconds. Just have a look at this. Does it give you an idea where would you like to focus on? It's too short a time for you to really analyze the data to the extent as you would like to. But basically, it would give you an objective evaluation of the data or the conditions that you have in an organization. So for the, because of the limitation of time, what I will do, I'll just quickly give you an analysis that we would have done so for this particular thing. And this particular organization, Say, for example, many of you already have pathways similar to what we have. So this data comes from National University Hospital. And every year, we would analyze our data to see which other areas should we focus on other than the existing pathways that we have. So what did we do after having looked at 2015 data was that when we looked at this particular table, we felt that most of the top volumes uh, DRGs that we have, they had an average length of stay of less than one, between one to three days. So if we were to implement pathways for that, it will not optimize care. It will not give you any dividends if you were to put on pathways in these areas. But basically, in, in some of the areas here, we already had pathways existing. So uh, it was no, um, we had to decide that these are, not, are to be excluded from our analysis. And if I were to look at the table two, these are the top 20 ALOS based DRGs. And this is where, the, basically, if you look at, most of the high ALOS DRGs have low or very low volume, uh, very, very low volume. Uh, conditions actually, except for tracheostomy. But if you look at tracheostomy data, the heterogenic patient population with different diagnosis makes it difficult for us to have a common pathway because the underlying disease conditions for these patients would be entirely different and when we cannot have a standardized clinical pathway for that. So this is how we can come to a conclusion on what pathways can be developed and which pathways need not be developed. And it helps you objectively to decide which pathways you should embark on. So basically, in typically in an organization, the high volume that you will be resorting to would be stroke. You will definitely have a high volume. Uh, acute myocardial infarction would be another condition which will be high volume, hip fractures, TKR. And if the clinical indicators related like high readmission rate, COPD, asthma, and renal failure, and also cardiac heart failure are the common conditions that you may encounter that you may want to focus on because these will utilize your resources to a large extent. And then others which are high risk will be something like gastrectomy, bar craniectomy, and these are the procedures which you would like to focus on, though the volume may be low. So the basic essentials, when you are trying to develop or manage clinical pathways, the most essential factor is that you must have a clinical champion to drive this project. If you cannot have a clinical champion, I don't think it will succeed to the extent you would like to. And basically, uh, the second most important or equally important is that you must have a multidisciplinary team that comprises all relevant stakeholders that are in the care team that is related to that condition. And you must specify the roles and responsibilities of each of the member of the team without which nothing can progress further. And of course, uh, it is equally important that you should leverage on evidence-based best care clinical practices through your literature review and so, so that you bring along best practices from all over the world to make sure that you are on par with the international standards. Adequate resources as best as possible and leadership support. If your departmental head does not support this particular project, I, will, I, I would tell you so that it will never succeed because you will not get consensus from other clinicians who are supposed to come on board. The last but not the least is the administrative support. Example, those people who will help you to collect data, evaluate, monitor and come up with some uh, reports and things that are timely available to you to make certain decisions and go through the PDSA cycles that you would like to do. So basically, if you look at the particular characteristics of the team that you should have, 
if you select the right team, you should have people with fundamental knowledge, not only clinical knowledge about the disease condition, but you should, those people should have organizational, patient or population based knowledge, work process related and the continuity of care. And basically after that only you can start engaging other clinicians in the team and the implementing process will start. On the right side of the, uh, on the right side of the slide is basically what we have as a typical standard team that you would like to have when you, if you are trying to develop a hip fracture pathway. So basically like things like a geriatrician, preferably an ortho geriatrician should be part and parcel because you would expect your geriatric patients to have more falls with hip fractures. One of the most important criteria that you must have in your team is one of the person should be something like a relentless drum beater who will not give up and pursue and persevere till you are able to implement and make sure that it continues to do well till it is implemented and runs well. So now I just would like you to spend about three to five per, uh, minutes of time because basically when projects fail, it has been proven beyond doubt that in 98% of the projects that have failed, they did not fail because they did not have good technical solutions. They failed because you did not use good change management principles, but you used basically, and the human factors involved in that were not taken into consideration when you were implementing those on the ground. So just spend a little bit of time and discuss with the, your neighbor, uh, how will you overcome the challenges in implementing and getting the buy-in? Because Dr. Sophia shared with you the barriers that you would, uh, you would, um, oh, you will encounter when you are trying to implement it. And the type of change management principles that you would like to engage or you would like to apply when you are trying to implement it on the ground. And how will you convince your CEO that this pathway has helped to improve patient care? Just spend about three to five minutes. Each organization will have its own challenges. Organizations within the different countries will have different challenges, but more or less the commonalities will always be there. And doctors saying that I will lose my autonomy if I were to implement clinical pathways, that's one of the greatest challenge that you may have to overcome. Any other key things that you would like to share with us, anyone? Please raise your hand. How will you convince your CEO that clinical pathways are good for the organization and they will enable and help him to uh, have better resource utilization? All right. So basically, again, before I hand over to Sophia, I would like you to take into consideration some of the things when developing the pathways and implementing these pathways. And if you scan through this whole list of uh, considerations, I would like to, I like, I would like you to note only two major ones because I don't want to go through the whole long list. You just focus on one. Try to maintain a balance between too much specificity and lose generality. Because basically if you have too much specificity, you will generate a lot of variance. And doctors will feel that they have lost their autonomy, their professional judgment is not being utilized, and you will not succeed in implementing the pathway as you would like to. And basically, if you have too much generality, it will have a reverse effect on that. 
Another point I would like you to note is basically do not create a wide gap between the current uh, reality that you have within your systems or the processes that are there and the revised content. So do not rock the boat too much. If you do the change, radical change in what you are implementing, probably people will feel a bit shaken and may not be willing to adopt to that practices. So that is why you must not create too wide a gap when we are implementing change. And another thing that you should also take note of is seek approval from relevant stakeholders, which I had earlier stated as well including the head of the department, which is very important because we have realized that one or two of our pathways have failed where we did not have consensus from the head of the department and it ultimately over the years it fizzled out. It did not get a buy-in as it was expected to. And basically remember in mind, the clinical paths are always dynamic. They will keep changing as the evidence in the world will keep changing. We have to go through educational and learning process as we revise our pathways, and pathways have to be reviewed every six months to 12 months after implementation. Initially, the review has to be more often as compared to later part of the times, and every 12 months review is um, sufficient after a few years of time. And uh, this will enable you to focus on certain things that do not work well, then you can revise it further. So how does documenting in clinical pathway happen? As I told you, we have plenty of pathways in our hospital. Most of them are still in our paper-based form. We are already on electronic documentation and not um, hardly few of our pathways have been converted to electronic one. But how do we convince our people to uh, use the pathways, to document uh, in the pathways? And we have to convince them that these are the integrated these are going to help you to integrate your documentation in the clinical pathway and everybody's notes will be in the same area. So basically a typical referral system for a clinical pathway starts with a referral form whereby the case managers are referred when a patient is put on a pathway through a referral form. And this notifies to them that a patient is on a pathway in a particular area. In addition to their routine rounds that they would undertake in the designated areas they are working in, the specialty that they are working in, they would do regular rounds, but some of the pathways, uh, patients who are put on pathway at night, they would have received a referral form, so they would go and review these patients to ensure that compliance is met with. The other thing that is very essential, the documentation should always start at the place of origin. And for the, it will always start in a clinic in an elective case, and it will start in an emergency department when it is an emergency case. And these are some of the additional reference guides that go along with the clinical pathways, and they do serve as a checklist for the staff to ensure that they are able to conduct the activities or actions that they are expected to conduct in a timely manner. So these are also kind of a trigger points for them to ensure that they need to do. And these have come across after a few years when they wanted to improve the care, especially for our colorectal surgeons, when they wanted to ensure that enhanced recovery after surgery protocol they wanted to implement. So they came up with this additional reference guides for the case managers and the nurse clinicians to ensure that they are taken care of timely. Then comes the first page. Typically, a clinical pathway, the first page always starts with guidelines on using the pathway. It tells you, the healthcare staff, on how to use the pathway, where to document, what to do, which are the inclusion and exclusion criteria, and so on and so forth. And the pathways usually do define with very cl much clarity whose role it is to do which action, who has to document on what area and what are the assessment that needs to be done by specific healthcare staff. So it kind of guides you through the whole care process as you go along. And better clarity as the continuum of care continues by eliciting every day what are the activities that need to be done. But along with the care pathways, there are certain other supporting documents that are developed so that we can provide appropriate education to our patients adequately so that our pathways also will help us to trigger that these kind of brochures need to be given to the patient to, in order for us to ensure that they are adequately briefed about their clinical condition. 
and the contents of these particular brochures are very simple written in layman's term for them to better understand either to the patient or the caregiver. After you have implemented the care paths, it's not sufficient implementing. Unless you continuously evaluate your pathways and continuously improve upon them, it will not succeed further. You will not be able to improve and raise the bar of quality of care that you provide to your patients in your organization. And basically, the list of indicators which is here, the standard markers which are, these are some common indicators that can be used for any kind of pathways that you have. So these are common or general indicators along with some specific indicators that you would like to monitor for disease specific conditions so that you are able to evaluate whether your pathways are functioning to the level that you expect them to function. Over to you, Sophia. Thank you, Sandhya. So now that you have a clinical pathway, good, the easy part of the job is probably done. The tough part would be to undergo a continuous PDSA and to manage the variances that you have found and to have the will to convince all the caregivers to, to come together to improve uh, the areas that we're not doing so well. So variance management is the ne next aspect. So what is variance? Any deviation? from the patient care activities, which may alter anticipated length of stay or outcome, as well as any of the complications that may occur. If uh, there's a discharge is delayed, for example, after AMI develop a fever, a CD scan is postponed, and a variance is usually something that will impact your length of stay, outcomes, or has altered the patient's treatment plan. So these are some of the clinical pathways over the years that we have developed in the National University Hospital. We didn't start with all of them at one time. We started on a few. And by means of showing these good results to the chief executive, managed to get more funding in order to implement more pathways and to have more case managers. Now, there are some areas we didn't do well, as Sandhya had previously mentioned. Uh, and we had coronary artery disease bypass, uh, pathways before and some other pathways, but unfortunately, the chief of department or the clinicians on the ground did not really uh, feel an ownership or feel that they were uh, engaged or find the pathway acceptable. No consensus could be obtained from the various consultants, and unfortunately, that means that the pathway withered off. Fortunately, some other departments would come forth and be very excited and enthusiastic, and then we would guide them in developing a pathway, and then they tend to be the more successful ones. So don't be disappointed if there is a natural phenomenon that occasionally a pathway may not work. And sometimes with a change of a new chief or new clinical director, then enthusiasm comes back again, and then we can re, uh, revitalize the pathway. So this is the overall organization of the, uh, ch we have a chairman medical board and a head of the Office of Clinical Governance and, uh, and there's Dr. Sandhya with the office, uh, who oversees many aspects of the, uh, of the uh, Office of Clinical Governance, including the case management unit. And we have like a chief case manager who also helps to oversee the other clinical pathways and case managers. So the case managers tend to be specialized in the various uh, areas, but they would cro cross cover each other for, uh, for leave and uh, in case of any exigencies. So we'd like to share with you some areas that we did well in, in terms of pathways. So one of the earliest pathways that we developed was that of a stroke. And you can see that this is the length of stay and the unscheduled readmission rate. Over the years, we have slowly managed to reduce our length of stay. It's pretty much stabilized. And fortunately, the unscheduled readmission rate has managed to stay quite stable. Our complications from stroke two uh, took a while, but uh, we have managed to reduce complications of urinary tract infection, pneumonia, and mortality. So this did not happened naturally, there were a whole slew of interventions that we had to take to help to reduce our variances. So monitoring assessment of stroke patients for risk of urinary tract infection and other preventative care, including early mobilization, hydration, removal of urinary catheters uh, as soon as possible, 
uh, early support for this charge step down from the hospital to the community. And one of the areas of stroke that we are not doing so well in but are trying to improve is for ischemic stroke, thrombolysis within the hour. So on the left side here is our Singapore's national, uh, in, uh, national data on thrombolysis within the hour. As uh, you're all well aware, the first hour is the golden hour and international standards would be up to 12% of thrombolysis should be within an hour. So we were not doing so well. In fact, we worsened a little as you could see over the years and when we analysed on the right side is, was our own hospital's uh, data, we also were not doing so well for a while. Thrombolysis within an hour actually worsened so we had to do a whole slew of interventions. Uh, in Singapore, we have certain indicators that we have to report to the Ministry of Health, which is the main funder for the public hospitals. And we have an agreement of what targets we should reach. And one of the targets that uh, they are keen on is, of course, a percentage of patients thrombolyzed within the hour. So a whole slew of interventions here. We managed to improve by means of changing the activation process so in the emergency department, there will be pre-activation when the ambulance is arriving in. They will call the emergency department, have a stroke team activated even before the CT scan's done, other blood pressure controls, and then ring fencing the high dependency bed and the nursing staff to ensure that the patient has somewhere to be uh, monitored. And uh, other logistics arrangements had to be made as well, pre-packing thrombolysis kits, and uh, now they're piloting a thrombolysis team. So quite a number of interventions had to be made. Now, one of the areas that we've been doing quite well in is also the colorectal pathway. So as you can see over the years, slowly the length of stay had uh, come down to from 12 to about 7.6. And uh, well, the unscheduled readmissions, uh, where we had a, a, a bad spell here where the readmission rate had increased and that was with the introduction of the laparoscopic surgery. So a whole adjustment process was needed. Patients were probably discharged a little too early and uh, without proper home care. So the clinical pathway allows this to be flagged up so that we could take appropriate action. We introduced hot clinics and more education, home support, and that helped our un unscheduled readmission rate to come down. Minor head injury pathway, that's actually been doing quite well, pretty stable. And for a while, we thought maybe we don't need to monitor this anymore. But the clinicians on the ground wanted this pathway to continue because they felt it was an excellent checklist in an area where you have very high turnover of junior doctors. At least these doctors are aware what is necessary. Gastrectomy pathway is also another area where we had uh, been doing fairly well. And uh, you can see the mortality and complication rate had reached a zero for a number of years. We did have a number of complications on anastomotic leak, but each one is just one patient. So now I'll turn over to Sandhya to talk to you about diabetic care. So apart from the earlier successes that Sophia shared, the another one that we have done pretty well, of course not as what we would like to expect, but we have done is on our hypoglycemia care path in optimizing the diabetes care, especially for hypoglycemia readmission rates. We have re been able to reduce our hypoglycemia readmission rate, not only in the inpatient area, but also in the EDTU, that is the extended diagnostic treatment unit in the emergency department. And for the past four years, we have been able to maintain at a very low level in inpatient area. However, our challenge remains in the process-related indicators which have been proven to say, state that <clears throat> if you are able to provide care according to these prescribed uh, processes, you will be able to achieve good outcomes. So namely in these two, two process indicators are the eye screening and the food screening. And these were the ones that we were able to pick up by way of tracking and picking it up through our monitoring of a clinical pathway. And we have been able to improve these two indicators over a period of years from a low of 38% here to almost as high as 66%, but we have not been able to reach our target levels as we would like to. 
basically so these are the areas where patients have to come back again to go through the diabetes uh, to the food screening and eye screening whereas the blood test like HB1C serum lipids, creatinine and urine ACR can be done on the same day as the consultation. So that is why the compliance rate for those investigations is much higher and could be achieved better as compared to eye and food screening. But in order for us to achieve better levels, we had to undertake a lot of activities and these are quite a bit of initiatives that we undertook. The ones that we, I would like to uh, share with you is basically uh, related to particularly to the eye and the food screening where we have enabled our enrolled nurses when we train them up to do walk-in food screening so anytime anybody can walk in and you don't need to take an appointment with a podiatrist or any other person and then in addition to the scheduled eye clinic our eye department enhanced further clinics just to provide support to the diabet diabetologist to ensure that they are given adequate support for eye screening. In addition to that, we also, uh, we also scheduled a mobile bus offering a walk-in fundal photography, which was parked in our clinic for two days a week so that patients can get a faster appointment for these things. In, in addition to that, our nurses would call up those patients who would default appointments or those who are due for appointments for this. So by doing these kind of things, we were able to get these people to understand. And, and, and we also engaged a very a high level of education material that was given out to these people so that it told them the importance of why these investigations are important for you to go through. Uh, and then there are some social and financial issues that were needed to be addressed, which the case managers and the medical social workers would address it, and that would be highlighted through the cl clinical pathway as well. The other success factor that we saw was basically that we made information available to every stakeholder, all stakeholders through our intranet whether it is the clinical pathways that are there or it is the data that is made available to them, the tracking of indicators. So that made them see that where we are, what it is. So this is one of the key factors. Availability of information plays a big role whenever you want to. So as I told you earlier, most of our clinical pathways are still paper-based, but we have moved on in our record system, which is mostly electronic. So we are trying to exploit IT to develop up, and we have taken baby steps to do that. And one of the earliest pathway that we have implemented in an electronic format is the hepatobiliary pathway because the head of the hepatobiliary unit is very, um, very he was very enthusiastic in developing this particular pathway into this. And we were able to implement that as soon as possible because we got funding to do this as well. Apart from the pathways that Sophia shared with you earlier, we do have some pathways which are short pathways that are implemented in our emergency department to ensure that the care that we provide in uh, emergency department is standardized and it is also serves as a checklist for junior doctors that rotate through the emergency department quite often and the rotation is in the residency system, it is every two months to every four months or every six months. So basically these uh, short pathways do provide good uh, checklist for the, and by doing this, the emergency department has been able to reduce their returns to emergency department within 48 hours and 72 hours from a very high of almost more than 30% to as low as less than five to 10%. But moving forward, instead of looking into only acute episodic care, that is not the way that we should have a pathway. The pathway should be integrated, they should be across the continuum of care, and this is where we are moving on. And the Ministry of Health in Singapore is also driving this particular project to ensure that we work with our community partners so that we are able to uh, decant our patients who have been stabilized to go down to step down care facilities and as a whole the acute care beds are made available to patients who deserve it more as compared to stable patients as so. So basically now two uh, hospitals in Singapore are trying out two 
major pathways. One is a hip fracture pathway, the other one is a stroke pathway and this once it is established it will be translated into an electronic pathway across the whole hospitals in Singapore. So this is the future of pathways that we are going to undertake in Singapore. So over to you Sophia. Yeah, thank you. Oh, oh, oh sorry. So what, do, what have we achieved? What do our staff feel about it? When we checked with our staff, this is the summary of the staff feedback that you can see. We did do a feedback survey with our staff and the overall assessment of case management services, they all felt that it was good and excellent. And most of them, they felt that the clinical pathway and case management services do add value to the care that we provide in our organization. Apart from that, many of the respondents even went to the extent to say that they could not manage without a case manager or a clinical pathway. So that is where we felt very encouraged that yes, those people who were objecting to have clinical pathway have moved on from that area to say that now they cannot do with pathways or without case managers who are helping them to make sure the coordination of care is done in a smooth and an efficient manner so that the patients can be sent to home or community care as early as possible. Thank you. So now we come to the back, uh, last slide of our session. So in conclusion, to have a good clinical pathway, you need a multidisciplinary approach. All stakeholders are very important. Definitely you need a good leadership to drive this and you must find an appropriate leader, usually it's a clinician who is enthusiastic. Monitoring and tracking of results are very useful. It reflects out the areas that are a problem for discussion and teamwork is very critical in the many different uh, professions need to work together well. Long-term perseverance is important. Sometimes it could take a year or more in order to get the results. Uh, integrate across all the entire care continuance important, not just within acute care hospital. In future, we need to work from all the way down to the step down care. And uh, we ourselves are still trying to learn from the best and other institutions, for example, Geisinger and Kaiser Permanente amongst many others. So thank you all very much for your attention.